Today on the podcast, we're diving into the mind of Paul Morris. Paul Morris is a videographer, a screenwriter. He does it all. And recently, he had a film that featured at the Glasgow Film Festival, but with a caveat. This film had no budget behind it. No budget for the script writing, no budget for the editing, no budget for the filming, no budget for the actors, and it made it to the Glasgow Film Festival. That is pretty unbelievable. If you are an aspiring videographer or photographer, this is the podcast for you. You're going to be learning how to shoot things on a budget. This is the Into the Mind podcast. My name is Harrison Brown. If you're watching, I hope this helps. Firstly, I think the question in the air is, what camera do you use? <laughs> uh, a Sony A7S Mark II. Mark II. Aye, so that was just because of its uh, the low light, um, and I had like a, a decent lens, it was like a Zeiss 16 to 35, and I had good autofocus, and because I didn't have like crew and things like that, yeah, um, good autofocus, good low light, and you'd be filming night scenes, and I wouldn't have people to like pull focus, and I'd be operating the camera a lot of the time, so or like most, of the, if I wasn't in the shot, I'd be operating the camera, so that was the main choices yeah, for that. Yeah. So you have a 16 to 35, so that's like your wide. And then do you have any other lenses in your kit? I think I did have a 50, but I think we only used that just because with the 50, the, it was a sort of cheaper lens, even though it looks great for yeah. stills and stuff like that, for video, try to pull focus on it can be a bit of a nightmare. And a lot of the stuff, I wanted to have a lot of movement. So putting that on a gimbal um, and trying to pull focus um, and mm -hmm. try to get that tighter shot, it was just better to go like 35. So I think I used the 16 to 35 for all of it, apart from the drone shots. And that was probably, that was, that was pretty wide as well. So yeah. I, don't, I don't know what that um, fixed lens was, maybe like 24 or something. So, so your kit, in essence, for the the movie, was it a Mavic 4? Uh, not a Mavic 4, a Phantom, Phantom 4. 4. Yeah. And then you had your camera and yeah. then a Ronin. Um, a, a Zhiyun crane, so it's like a cheaper version of that. So it's right. like it's dead light and it's not as sturdy as a Ronin. But then also I'd built up over the years to kind of like some old school kind of filming kit, like... Um, a dolly track that were pretty much just like pvc poles then um, with a kind of sturdy dolly and i had a jib that was like a, a six foot jib um just because i loved it the kind of the kit the the crane shots if you could get them and i had shots planned yeah so uh, i did have other wee bits of kit but again like they are for the style that we were shooting in try to get everyone there having a very short amount of time fighting the elements most of the time it would either be on a tripod if i wasn't if i was in the shot and i had to be locked off um, or I'd have it on the gimbal, so that was the main bits of kit. And would you prefer a Canon or a Sony? <laughs> you know, what I love about Canon uh, is the the colours of them. Do you mean see skin tones yeah. and stuff like that? I find with the the Sony, especially, I think it's better with like the FX9 and stuff. I've never used these cameras, just videos I've looked at. The the colour science is a bit better, but a lot of the time like the oranges can look really like kind of yellow and the skin tones can mm. never get right, but with the Canon it seems like quite rich. But I had a Canon as like a cheap DSLR before, like it was a, I can't remember, like a 750D, a Rebel, whatever it was, um, before I upgraded to the Sony. But you're just drowning by the time you, you commit to buying something or you get the money together to buy a bit of kit. There's a video saying like, oh, mm -hmm. but wait for this point to the mark and you're like, because yeah. it's going to have that. And you're just, it's the same with everything, even like with P, I was trying, I was upgrading my PC with like a gaming card um, for doing animation. And it was the same thing. It was like, oh, um, but this performs 20% better. So it's almost like, oh, so you shouldn't even bother with that. And it's yeah. like, I, I eventually you just need to say, these are the tools and this is what I'm going to do. And I just yeah. committed to it. So, Yeah, there's also, the, there's the thing that I think cameras are going so far now though. Like you see the Canon R5, which is this one here, mm -hmm. which, which is filming you. Um, there was this huge thing. Oh, it shoots 8K raw. And everyone went mental about it. I've shot an 8K with that camera and I've put it on my computer and my computer crashes. Mm -hmm. I can't film an 8K can't with edit it. it. So it's like, wh where's the line in terms of what you actually need and what mm. you don't? Exactly. Uh, because there's so many huge movies now that are being filmed literally on these cameras mm -hmm. that you don't you don't really need all the the huge you know capability of which the camera can shoot. You're probably not going to shoot in 8K. No. You're probably going to shoot maybe in 4K, mm -hmm. um, if it's a huge project, if it's maybe a YouTube video. What what did you shoot when you were shoot, shooting your film? Was it 4K log? Yeah, but it was hard because it was um, S log three, so dead washed out. Obviously, mm -hmm. when you then you had to go and color grade it, so that took a bit of time, but it gives you sort of more room in the editing. But uh, uh, 
when I when I shot on it, it was 4K for some of it, but some of it was 1080p, just the type of cards that we had in the very yeah. very early days because I started shooting 2018. Um, so I got other like SD cards and stuff like that. So some of it was 4K, but as you say, I didn't really notice a huge difference with it because um, you just expanded it in yeah. post, and you didn't see any difference on the on the kind of bigger screens in terms of the TV. No, I, I didn't really know, and I tested it quite a few times. But I, I suppose you you would. But I think again, because the camera wasn't ultra expensive, I'm sure if you were you did have an ARRI or something like that, you would obviously notice a difference if you were to blow it up. Mm. Um, but again, it's one of those sort of things, the concessions you make, you go, I've shot this just now, but I'll shoot this going forward in, in 4K and see see what happens. But I didn't notice a huge difference at all, really. Yeah. And when you're editing and filming, would you suggest for people to shoot in 4K so that they have flexibility? Or do you think that most things would probably be okay in sort of 1080? I'd say if you can go 4K, just if, you, if your cards are big enough, and uh, I would say if you've got the option to go for a higher quality, you should. And then if you do have any sort of things, you need to crop out and you need to punch in a bit and stuff like that. But obviously you should be kind of careful you're framing anyway, so you don't yeah. really want to start cheating in post. But uh, I, I say if you've got the option to do it bigger or do it a bit more um, precise or a higher quality, I would always try and go for that. But if you don't, like yeah. I, I just feel that so many like video i see like comments and stuff even when i'm looking at kit and things like that and it, it seems so much like cart before the horse like so many people mm-hmm. spend a lot of time look for the right bit of equipment for the right spec um before they've got a, a script idea do you know what i mean and it's almost like that sort of gear uh gear envy or like that sort of desire to get the best best possible tools there's just so much time wasted when the stuff that really matters as much as important as that stuff is if the fundamentals aren't there and yeah. you're not expanding that then it's it's kind of pointless like who cares if you if it is 4k or 1080 because there's films that have been amazing a lot less quality yeah yeah that, yeah that it's interesting you say that i think there is this kind of hype factor that goes into cameras now I, listen you have huge youtubers like peter mckinnon that are obviously sponsored by canon so mm-hmm. every canon product if it's a big launch he's probably going to do a video on it mm-hmm. and it's probably going to create a certain amount of hype around specific cameras but the odds are you don't need that much in terms of quality it's no. more about how you use it and uh-huh. um, where did you learn video and photography just youtube youtube yeah just youtube so you're totally self-taught in terms of that process in terms of starting that filming process and taking it into the editing room youtube and a master class but that's not i was just more of a sort of kind of general from people that uh, have you heard the master class i haven't no it's um it started off and it was only like aaron sorkin and a couple of other people and like great writers and then more and more but it's david mama a playwright then scorsese did one and it's basically like a couple of series that they take it through bit by bit writing editing and all that or like their, their specific genre but now it's like christina aguilera usher honestly it's huge this list it's a huge huge company i think it's san francisco and um, but i would do that for writing and then it was just youtube tutorials um to learn about the actual the actual filming but again like scorsese and everyone's the first one to say it it's like these are just like technical issues learn them but then mm-hmm. again it has to come from you not not to sound like a purist or like that be the artist and be a bit poncy but again it's going to how you interpret that or how you use it, it's going to be the, the fundamental of it it's not going to be the spec mm-hmm. and again the point of view that they're becoming from if they are selling a promoted product not to be cynical but they of course they're going to point out the differences yeah. in it but you shouldn't yeah. think about that as anything pre-gen that is yeah. terrible and, and who cares i mean because yeah. Like I said, it's cut before the horse stuff. There's other fundamentals there that, that you need to develop. Yeah, and there's also, there's this thing when a new camera comes out, say that the Canon R5 comes out, the previous version all of a sudden drops and halves in value. You can save a fortune. Mm-hmm. And the amount of the amount of money that I spent or have spent on that, that R5 as well as the RF lenses, I probably didn't need it. Mm. It's good to have it, and it's a great camera. But we've got the R six that that Drew shoots on, mm-hmm. and it's probably just as good. Well, we probably use the same functionality from it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, how did you find using a drone? Have you? Got, uh, how did you find using it? Did you learn quite quick, or I did. Um, I, I got it. <clears throat> I think twenty seventeen, and I knew I wanted. This is when I was writing the film, and I knew that I wanted it for this kind of style, and I thought it would add, add a bit of scale to it, or add a bit of sort of. Um, immersion to it because it's going to be a low end film but if you could get mm-hmm. the angles and you could use the camera in an interesting way then you could do a lot with it I started using it just going out to like beaches and stuff like that but when I got it there was very little information about drone use and stuff like that mm. but um, 
I started using it and it, apparently it was faulty and it was beeping and stuff like that. But there was, like I said, there wasn't a huge amount of information. I got it replaced, started using it more and more, and then eventually got like my license for it. And I would use it for like uh, property videos. Yeah. I'd go out and test it. I would, if I knew it was, like years in advance for the scenes I'd actually shoot, but I'd be out doing like rehearsals with it and getting the movement right so you could the. Uh, move it in like a few different axes not just like a sort of straight and yeah. then up and down you mean like having the camera tilt moving that way but then also sort of like turning and going up just more up interesting around. shots yeah. Uh -huh. yeah so i practiced with that a lot and probably put a lot of hours in same with the gimbal same with the camera mm. i was always out photographing or, or using a uh, video made a lot of shorts mm. um so i always had a lot of hands on uh, the camera time yeah. so I, I did put a lot of hours in with it before the 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 film was but began its inception of kind of writing you were always in cameras before then and this w was kind of after you got into cameras is that when you got the idea of the film or did you begin getting into cameras and then thought i want to make a film the, the no i was all it was more the idea first and then what, what do you need then do you know what i mean that's so maybe yeah. that's why i'm not as kind of focused on tech as much as much as i kind of look into it so maybe it's because i'm always like the idea and then it was like what are the tools you need to kind of make that happen really then, yeah so it was never like oh i'm I'm a photography nut or i grew up with like, the best cameras or like i've got a kind of dp background it was nothing like that it was more i was more um started off like acting when i was in like primary school and then fell away from that and then i did like sketches and stuff like after i left high school then got a camera i got knocked back from doing acting at the conservatoire but I, mm. like i didn't really feel bad about it at all because i thought like okay that it's actually the writing and the performance part i like but then i realized as i got more into writing and then more time with the camera and like the production side editing that was more the writing directing so it was kind of natural from that point of view but it was just get a camera see what you can do with it and mm. i thought that was like a really good process to learn with you know just because it was more the idea and then see what you can do with the camera use it as an extension of the idea rather than camera first idea after it yeah talk about throwing yourself in at the deep end mm. but it's, it, all, it was organic it was like over a few years and i was and i suppose it was like a quite a good way it was like i would write f for ages but do a lot of writing, do a lot of sketches, watch a lot of films, do shorts. So every time you're kind of going and watching a great film or, or you're reading more, <clears> then you'd come back and you'd have more to do with the camera and then it was just developed, you know. So mm -hmm. it didn't feel that way at the time. It's just that I, I really wanted to get good at it and learn more about it. So, uh, but other other areas that I've got no interest in, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't do that and I couldn't have that learning curve. But if I, mm -hmm. there's a desire there to do it, which I had, then it didn't feel like a big task. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I think that, that there's this thing, especially um, when I reflect on how I was as a kid, if I didn't want to do something, I was the most stubborn kid. Like I, you, there was no telling me to do it. But if I myself wanted to do something, I would hyper-focus totally on that thing mm -hmm. for as long as it took. Um, and you find that a lot of creatives, video editors and photographers especially, kind of have that. Mm -hmm. And they'll do really like weird stuff to other people that seem really normal to them for example get up at two in the morning to chase that great light mm -hmm. nobody really understands that but we are so motivated in what we want to capture and what we want to do we'll put in those extra hours and that that go that extra kind of that extra kind of mile when did the kind of inception for the actual script begin what well, when was the idea 2019 no 20 I wrote it from 2016 to 2018. I'd made a short version of it, and I think tw early, like kind of mid 2016 or early 2016 that I'd, I'd shot um, a sketch version of it. But I suppose there was always an idea about using the locations that I grew up in and the experience of that, and how how would you tell that story? And then mm -hmm. after I'd made all the shorts, I was thinking if it was my first feature, you know, how would you how would you do it? And how would you tell that story? What do you love about films? How would you translate that experience? There's a there's certain ways you can do it. You could show the grim reality of it, which can mm. be done really well and can be really hard hitting. But I thought there's other elements I wanted to include. So I suppose it didn't really just come with like scene one to like the end. It wasn't like a sort of a chronological thing. It was more pulling ideas and then the writing process took a while because it was my first like feature script. Um, just pulling that all together and seeing what was the sort of natural progression of it, learning about writing, doing all these things like masterclass and stuff in mm. between, like what am I missing here? what like structure and all these other things like uh, the poetics is like a book by aristotle like the kind of first or the, the earliest thing on drama reading all these things like does my story have that like what, what am i missing and um then i just started developing it from there and then finished that started shooting 2018 and finished it and 
it was three, like three years just after we started filming our first scene, like almost exactly. So uh, it was 2016 that the idea mm. came about for it, I think. So it's fa- five years, so total five years. And then the, the festivals and editing and all that. So I uh, probably like five or six years. I. That is a long time. Mm. See, when I think where I was five years ago, but well, I'm 25 right now, I was 20. I was in Colombia, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. so just, just traveling and I was such a different person. How did you, the two questions come off the back of that. Firstly, how did you maintain motivation throughout the five years? Because that's a long time. Um, and also, what kind of learnings did you take from that script writing process? Is there any structural points that you can give people that will help them with a script? Mm-hmm. I think the, it's the same thing as you're talking about editors or photographers getting up at early, early doors to do it. That You do it not to be like, I got up at two. It's mm. more the kind of what you you're gonna get. You know, it's a selfish reason. It's not this sort of like um, honourable thing. It's not as mm. a self. I want this. I want to see this. And to other people, it'll look like oh god, so dedicated. But to you, it's a selfish thing. Like I've got a desire to kind of capture that. Uh huh. It's yeah. for you. Do, do you mean it's it's not a it's not I'm so dedicated to my craft. Do you mean it's like the first thing is the desire and the sort of like the my own selfish reasons for wanting to do it. Like I thought right, this could work. So with the script. It was more like every time you know you'd sit down to sit down and write it every morning, then at night after work, um, and it would be like the day the daily thing, like okay, well how did this scene improve? What am I missing here? You know, bang your head against the wall. Then you've got a few scenes. It's like oh, but this would be good here. Get to the end of that, and once you finally got a script after for two years, it was for me finally getting something. That I think I could film this, and I would be happy with it. This I think this would work as a film. Then it's like oh, if we could get people together, then you get that first scene, and it turns out like you wanted it to and it's like mm. well that works a bit oh we need another one now so every time you're doing that you've got so much like banked where yeah. you do you mean you're never thinking about the thing as a whole it's always about the individual what's the next bit i need to get then there were obviously times where you did feel like you were drowning and it was but it was always just sort of like total immersion it was like every day you know i was thinking about it or doing something about it or working on it making props or thinking about the next scene trying to get that organized out of my camera practicing stuff so it never felt like that you know obviously mm-hmm. it was a long time but again like, what, what else was i going to do do you mean that's what i wanted to do and in terms of like lessons from writing a script it was difficult because the script i'd written was quite long and i didn't write it in probably the traditional fashion i wrote it in like microsoft word and it was probably a lot more description in it than you would normally have you'd have it quite stripped back and like mm-hmm. just minimum action and dialogue so i wrote it with the purpose of people that I wanted to be in it and I wrote it for my, myself in terms of the, the kind of world you were building so it wasn't something I could like sell if you know what I mean it wasn't mm. like a kind of strict um, I'm a screenwriter it was always with the intention that I was going to make this so that was quite that was good in a lot of ways but in terms of structure I mean there's just I think you just need to you need to like watch a lot of films and I think you need to perhaps you don't need to because I think Tarantino's quite against like books on it and any sort of like academia around films he's just if you love films um then you can make a great one if you really love films that's his sort of mantra but i think you also need to look at how you process information like with tarantino like he's obviously seen a tremendous amount of films and television so the way mm-hmm. he takes he used to say that he would go to a screening himself and then he would go back with his friends or whatever and then look at how they did it. So he mm. maybe is like very visual or he that's maybe how he takes information and he analyzes it. But for me, I do get a lot of reading and listen to people talking about it. And I, I, I do quite like the sort of analytical side of it. So that, that did give me a lot. But for you, it might just be a case of watching a lot of films or it might be spending time in public hearing how people speak. And that might be kind of a, a rich vein for you to tap into. So I think it's finding out what your sort of like learning style is, you know, is it visual or is it like um, verbal or I, I don't know, or maybe it's just getting, some people maybe just turn up and they'll improv a scene like that. To me, that I, I don't think you should do that, but maybe that's how you get the juices flowing, you mean, but I think it's totally individual, but I think just setting aside creative time and not just saying I've got an idea and sitting yeah. on that for years and years because it, it, you'll have that till the day you die, you know, be somebody mm-hmm. in the pub telling you about what they were going to do or how they're going to do this, do you know what I mean? So... I think it's just getting moving and setting aside time and treating it like training. That, that's what I would say. I think that's one of the incredible parts of your story because you didn't just, you had this idea, you had no equipment, you had no budget, but you still actioned it. And I think that's a pretty valuable lesson for anybody to learn that's watching this is that it, it, you, whatever you are uh, investing in at that point, that idea can be actioned, mm. but you just need to take that first step. What was the first step for you? Was it buying the camera or was it starting to write the script? What came first? 
it's it's funny because to me it was I was making sketches and stuff on my phone and it was just for my friends group like people I knew on Facebook and Instagram when that just came out that's how, how long ago like 2012 and I was just making like oh this would be funny like do do that and then it was like oh but I, I do love films and I would be learning more about films and then it was like making making shorts uh, so I mean it, it, it's, it's a really it's really hard to tell in terms of where that all started or where it came yeah. from but it was organic I suppose yeah yeah you were just inspired who, who do you think the inspiration was probably my dad my dad was a big film buff mm. um and we'd obviously like watch a lot of films but then i think coming away from when i left school i didn't really like have any plans at all that i didn't want to go to uni or anything like that and i, I just kind of think like who am i that was probably my biggest thing you know obviously mm. you talked about traveling and stuff and i don't know if that was like a big sort of self-discovery journey for you but for me leaving school and working was probably the best thing you could do was just sort of being in a, in a monotonous environment yeah and sort of really being like right this is what you don't want in terms of like who are you and try to figure that out away from like being away from your peers and obviously the pressures of school so i think that was probably that and my dad's influence but then also like my my grand's that very theatrical and like my, my my papa was like a singer as well so i was always sort of kind of around people who were yeah. like sort of like aspirations of show business or like people who were, were quite um quite animated um or people that kind of inspired me in that way and then just my friends really and just yeah. how they spoke and that's really where it all, all kind of came from and then you sort of learn about all these great directors um and then they, they become like your heroes as well but i think that's probably where it all kind of came from my dad has sense of humor and his film sensibilities in the mm. early days and did your dad help you so when you started this kind of filming process and script was your you said your dad was the inspiration was he kind of supportive in that he, he he passed away in like 2017 so mm. i'd already wrote like quite a few wee pages of it but really kicked it up a gear not long after that probably just subconsciously i, I just thinking like get moving you know that kind of fear of like death and like you know using your time i suppose mm. that's maybe what that, that wasn't a conscious thing but i think uh he was always like i would send him shorts and stuff and like i'd he stayed like um through the air at the time or like trune or something or tur turbotan it's called a turbotan they call it um he stayed through there and he'd send me like emails like, "Oh, this was good. I like this and stuff yeah, like that." So he was more hand offish. He he was a lecturer, um, a uni lecturer at, at, when he was younger, and uh, he was great with stuff like that. With just wee words here and there. He was never like kind of mm -hmm. right. This is how it's done, and this is who you should watch. He would just put things under your nose, like, "Oh, um, I'd ask him about Harold Pinter in the next the next week. He'd bring me like a book of plays by him. You know, he was yeah. great in that sort of way. Just like yeah. wee things he'd pick up on, or he'd ask about a director." And he'd give me a couple of DVDs, but that's the one that you should ha have a look at. That's interesting. So he he was great in that sort of formative years. But then when I started making stuff myself, it was more taking ownership. It's like what do I like, you know, rather mm -hmm. than depending on a mentor as such. So I suppose as I grew older, he wasn't in that role as much. But I obviously valued his opinion. Yeah. But it was more at that stage. I was kind of coming into my own and trying to find my own voice yeah. as a as a writer and who I was. Yeah. and he was giving you different things to to see and mm -hmm. to to try out mm -hmm. um and he, and he was kind of trying to inspire you in that way i'm sorry mm -hmm. to hear that about your oh, that's okay mate no that's fine um you know that that's uh, interesting so you think that it kind of got kicked kicked up a gear um, I, I think so yeah. I, when, he, when he passed away i think it was because sorry but that's away um because i was saying that to like when i was like recalling it i was like it can't be a coincidence that around that time the writing ramped up mm. if you know what i mean i think it was more like get serious in some sort of way just in the back of my head uh and it, and it must have had an impact but then again the, the age i was i started writing it when i was 25 and i don't i mean that's not a coincidence either the kind of age where you're sort of really considering your, your options you know you've had yeah. a bit of time growing up out of school and you've done a bit of exploring but whatever that is you know academically or like geographically and you're starting to kind of get a wee bit more comfortable with who you are as a, a kind of mm. an adult and then it's like, well, who am I and what am I going to put my efforts into? Um, yeah. It's and a confusing getting, time for people. It's, it's terrifying. Yeah. It's if you don't, if you don't have that grand passion or you don't have that sort of direction. I mean, it's 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 really scary. Like where you can end up, and and if and if you don't choose, and something else chooses for you, and you don't like the direction it's going yeah. in, but then you've made decisions that have impacted your life, and you've got duties and stuff like that. You know, yeah, if you have kids, too late. And, uh huh. Do you know what I mean? And it can happen. Yeah. And I don't think it's ever in a position where you can't then pursue what you want to do but then like just now we're talking about like i've just had a, a wee girl you know and if that happened like 10 years ago you know who knows how those little things can like change the, your trajectory of your life or what you can choose mm -hmm. to do but then you can come back to it you it's not a like having the responsibility stuff isn't a death sentence you know but it just means that you need to recalibrate but uh 
it's it's scary that time you know obviously you you say you're 25 25 yeah and it is and like i mean i don't think it can be a coincidence that you're like obviously you've been doing a lot of work anyway do you know what I mean so you've always always had that but there, there is this for me at least there was this thing in the back of the head like your age and where, where am i go, what am i doing but yeah. i mean I suppose that's always there even when you're a kid and when you're a teenager and when you're older i suppose yeah. you're always gonna have that question yeah i think i think everyone has that to an extent um and i think that for sure there were there was I think we were very lucky to have found something that consumes us as all consuming and that we love with a passion. Mm -hmm. um, and I, de I definitely, definitely found that within editing. And I think that video editing came first for me because it was almost like therapy for me. Mm -hmm. I'd sit and I'd video edit and that would clear my head. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that, that script writing was kind of your therapy in a way you, you kept, uh, you kind of ramped up after the passing of your dad? Do you think that was kind of how you processed that grief? I think it must have been in some ways. I think it's always cathartic in a way, but there's a, to me, I was always kind of conscious of, especially writing like original scripts. I never wanted it to be, at least in the writing process, autobiographical or having a moan. You know, I never write, wanted to write. That's, maybe that's why I steered so like much away from like social realism or like that kind of kitchen sink stuff because I was so scared of it being like, oh, this is a writer talking about how much he hates his job, how hard he's had it, mm. um, how this and that. And I, I what I wanted to do was sort of like translate that and make it more of a thing for the audience, like make it sort of big and grand and try and like ra what was missing rather than portraying how it was and not being autobiographical. So in like a lot of ways it was cathartic, but you know, then again, a lot of things are, you know, a lot of just mm -hmm. big events are and in the writing, I think it's more just doing something for yourself and feeling that you're coming into your own and that feeling of like, making progress is like the ultimate feeling to feel like you are moving in a direction you know I, yeah. I don't think anything yeah. trumps that you know and that trumps like that can pull you out of so like such so many like dark places and in my yeah. opinion anyway if you've got that lifeline and um, obviously family you know it's essential it's, having it as a given that all those things are in place but if you've got that consuming passion and you mm -hmm. can like get lost in it maybe it's a distract maybe a therapist would say that's not healthy you're just distracting yourself but i just think being able to just to jump all in uh it's like a great thing to have. It's like a great thing to lose yourself. And I don't know if that's how you felt with editing. A hundred percent. I think that when I when I would edit, I'd lose track of time totally, um, and and because it was all consuming, it was yeah. As I say, it was kind of the the, the therapy in a lot of way. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you had any shit points in that day where somebody said something to you that you didn't like, I'd sit and I'd edit, and I'd achieve something that day. I mm -hmm. think that was a lot of it. I think you probably would have experienced that when you when you finished that first scene oh endorphin rush i'll do the next scene mm -hmm. and then you did the next scene oh i like that uh -huh. i'll do the next one and then the next one and then all of a sudden the days blend in and you're halfway through a, a, a movie uh -huh. and you're ha one and a half years two years deep uh -huh. um, and i think having that all-consuming passion can really really help people but they're, they're, it's complicated because people get sometimes people go to university and this almost happened to me and they study something that they're not that keen on mm -hmm. and they're just there for the social element. So I know that you said you didn't go to uni and actually I think a lot of the time nowadays that can be more beneficial. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to university, not because not, not out of choice. I applied for video and photography and I didn't get in. So looking back, if I had got into university for video and photography, I would, I would have got out of uni two years ago but at that point two years ago i'd achieved a lot within my niche already mm -hmm. um so i think the education processes can be a bit weird because you you can teach yourself a lot chisholm hunter are the sponsors of the into the mind podcast and for those of you that don't know chisholm hunter are a uk wide jewelers and to top off they're still family run after 165 years over 165 years of running they were established in 1857, which is pretty damn incredible. They sell luxury diamonds and also luxury watches. For example, Tudor watches, Hamilton, what I've gone on at the moment, or Amiga watches. Whatever watch brand you'd like, they probably have it, the odds are. Or if you're looking for silver jewellery, like I have on today, or a gold chain, then head to chismhunter.co.uk. That's chismhunter.co.uk. And on that note, let's get back to the podcast. I think even especially certain fields, obviously like lawyer, doctor, obviously the, the obvious fields where you need a formal education, but I, I think with creative subjects, there are benefits 
to like acting schools there are benefits to going to certain places from a networking point of view is maybe if you go to like a great film school you'll make you'll meet a dp you'll meet an editor you'll maybe meet like so and so or you'll get a, an opportunity to launch your short film and you'll have the backing of this school mm-hmm. and that may open certain doors for you but in terms of personal development I think that is one of the best, I cannot back and be one of the best things, like obviously there's examples of like college dropouts and uni dropouts and I don't think you should use that to justify every time you want to th- like throw in a towel or something doesn't go in your way, you shouldn't say well Zuckerberg, you know, been like you need yeah. using, do you mean it's a bit extreme, but then like Spielberg didn't get into UCLA um, and then became like the youngest ever TV director, um, hired by, I can't remember, Universal maybe, and obviously look at his trajectory, so I think it's just in terms of finding it something that you're passionate about and then making your own curriculum like i get a lot of satisfaction out of that because i went i did a writing course for like six months at glasgow and i don't know what my idea was of it was i've been working for a while um and i seen something like oh the opportunity to meet industry contacts so for me it was like right okay i've been making sketches and stuff and i've been writing i've written like a sitcom pilot um this will be great i'll meet these people and um, i'll get a job writing not understanding the state of like the Scottish like film and TV industry at the time and not understanding like how these things really go really it was just a mock interview and p- people basically just being nice from like certain production companies to come in and meet the students mm. but um, I dropped out of that and then that's when I got my camera and that's when I started making shorts and that's when I started like doing my own thing but in, uh, for me anyway in that kind of academic environment the tutor becomes dad the tutor becomes mm. like parent the one you want to please and then they're giving you what they what they're showing you and they're giving you like films to watch and their opinions on what you're writing or what you're making and also if you're strong enough you can ignore that but at the same time if you're trying to achieve a grade and you're competing with other people in the classroom and there's a sort of hierarchy i think that can be dangerous whereas if you're yeah. on your own in a lot of ways and you're making things for your own satisfaction i think that's great for certain personalities but to me personally that's what i felt like when i started making stuff myself like that's when i just felt brilliant because i knew you probably feel the same a lot of people study the courses never pick up a camera again or never write anything again yeah but when you're on your own and it's off your own back in terms of you want to do this then your productivity just like shoots up and it's not for the sake of being productive it's because that desire to get better and improve i think yeah yeah and also there's, there's an aspect of it that's like you're you're doing it for you yep. and if anyone is to blame it's you uh-huh. so when i had teachers and i was i was a total nightmare in school and um like a total nightmare but when i had teachers i was like why am i doing this for you like i i've no i've listen you're trying to teach me i get it i don't care about pythagoras i i don't give a shit <laughs> like, I, I don't want to do it um whereas if i i, I and uh, subsequently i'd get angry when i was wrong so but like if i do something for myself i know that the only one to blame is myself so it it, it motivates me to learn and do and and teach myself more i'm not sure if you get this but you you kind of um you you kind of like how do i how do i even put this i've totally forgotten what i was going to say now (laughs) with the pressure on yourself do you mean in terms of like creating your own sort of like anxiety about it and like your own sort of like expectation yeah your own expectation but you almost work 10 times as hard for yourself than you do someone else and i think i think it's because you know that you were to blame if something Uh was wrong and i think because the the blame has shifted from potentially being the teacher's fault to being your fault Uh that you think i need to work at this harder Uh and then and then for me anyway this is just my experience but I would edit till one in the morning and then i'd go into work the next day and then i'd come back from work and i'd say right i'll edit even more and then bit by bit progressively you get better but it's through trial and error um, and and also you're not confined to like if you say something wrong that's out with this box it's immediately wrong uh-huh. because it's stylized yep so like for example with your movie um i know that because it was a budget film there wasn't as much lighting it was quite it was quite like natural lighting uh-huh. um that some people would perceive that as oh what needs to be studio lighting but doesn't necessarily because it's Mm -hmm. creative so it's like you're not necessarily wrong in whatever you're doing does that Mm -hmm. make sense no exactly and if i'd went to a film school and i'd studied with dps and i did a lighting course then as soon as i showed them my setup for the day Mm -hmm. that what i was shooting on and this sort of how you know if i had that training behind me and i get told this is how you make a film and the things that you need if i knew that 
your skeleton skeleton crew is gonna be like five people and i knew just me with the camera and like putting the the boom on a, a c stand then I've, then that would have been like anxiety coming in but because yeah. i was like i just need to capture the image and capture the sound and i know what i want to try and get because i didn't have those sort of like stumbling blocks now that can work against you and sometimes your ignorance can kind of work against you mm. but again i think you're right i think not having that sort of not having that understanding of what other people would be coming from in terms of the traditional academic route then it did o open a lot of doors for me in terms of what i thought would be possible and my sort of naivety as well but again like there's pros and cons you know because you might end up like with this great pause short but then you also might go to these film schools and just feel totally like overwhelmed as well yeah uh, there's too many options almost uh-huh and also you know yeah. what you need and you know how things are done and you become part of that sort of rat race in a lot of ways um but then it might be a great education for you like just certain things that i just can't really do like networking and like mixing with like going to just general mixers do you know what i mean like i i feel like i'm quite a sociable person but certain things i'm just not good at and I've, i probably don't have the training for my, like i'm happy so i'm just like at my desk and i'm just thinking mm -hmm. like what we're doing next that's kind of where i like to be uh but the th like certain things might hold you back and I'm, I'm aware of that but i suppose as long as i'm kind of chasing that creative creative idea then uh, that's when i kind of feel satisfaction would you say you're more introverted hard to tell because then i'm like making all these things you mean and then i'm like acting in front of the camera and then like i'm I can be like loud when I'm out drinking, you know, and like feel, but sometimes I feel like I'm maybe too extroverted. I mean, it's just hard to tell. I just think it depends on the environment, but I think uh, there is a certain amount of time where I just want to spend chasing that sort of thing, that creative side of things, that playtime for, mm -hmm. for yourself. There is a certain amount of that, but uh, I really just think it's, I need to simplify it really. I just think that the more I learn and a lot of times the more you learn it kind of strangles you in terms of about your nature about mm -hmm. the academic side the sort of pitfalls like what you are like you were talking earlier about the hypnotist and sort of telling you like little gives and you know your what you call your tells and all that like a, a scratch of the leg or sort of body yeah. language and sometimes it like becoming hyper aware of your own sort of like behaviors can mm -hmm. kill it if you know what I mean so I think it kills, the, it kills the spark it does uh, you're a hundred percent right I, I, there's something that a lot of creators that I know of experienced they'll be on a train and they'll be posting 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 and then they have a gap and then they look back at what they've done before and they think shit i can't post this next thing because it's not as good as the last thing mm -hmm. um and then the train the, 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 you just come off the platform and then, and then you can't it, you end up just not being able to to function as you were almost because mm -hmm. you're like you're, you're constantly comparing yourself firstly to others which is what social media is but also to your own work mm -hmm. and no two projects will be the same no so the way that you felt about a previous project say you were shooting in i don't know norway versus shooting in portugal mm -hmm. they're not going to be the same so, but you're comparing them now you try and stick that lot on and you're like yeah uh this doesn't, doesn't work. pop man like i know what do i do yeah. but that i mean to me that's sort of like where the juice is like i just feel like take everything away take every single like idea or whatever like thing you get told try and empty your head what interests me that's the bottom line like mm -hmm. that's what do i find interesting now of course there's going to be times where especially in writing like I was talking about structure and stuff earlier, there's going to be times where it's like certain things need to happen for momentum. It can't just be a case of like, oh, it'd be great if so-and-so walked in, it'd be great if I expanded this. Mm -hmm. You know, there's certain things, you, there are, certain limitations are great. A time, um, like your own boredom, your own expectation of the audience, they, those are things that are maybe in your blood and you can sort of like, all right, okay, now we need to kind of pull it back. But I think really the bottom line needs to be whenever you go down to do something, it's like, what interests me? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing to chase. But i think that's the thing you should like talking about going to a different country or trying a new like that the people that do those same sort of things are talking about youtubers and stuff yeah. earlier and they become famous for and like, if you don't if you're not growing like you're dying do you know what i mean yeah. you have to chase that you have to then venture out F but fuel the scary. engine fuel, yeah, again fuel the engine of the car i think much. so if you don't put petrol in it then eventually it'll die you see there's youtubers like sam colder by the way you should check him out if you haven't he's who is he sam cold is a really really talented youtuber and he uh pioneered in essence that kind of transition you know when you get like a zoom transition oh, the clutches and all that yeah <laughs> yeah he, he in essence pioneered it really talented guy um but he got famous really really quick i think he got one point i think he's got like 1.4 million subscribers and then he just stopped posting mm -hmm. and he and he said 
I stop fueling the the engine, so to speak. I know that if I post in that YouTube account now or Instagram account, whatever it is, it just won't perform. Uh-huh. And he linked it so intrinsically with his personality that it killed the fire, uh-huh. so to speak. Now, he obviously does projects, but he only works now for brands that he wants to work for. He's not doing it for himself anymore. Uh-huh. And I think that if you get too invested into a social media platform, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, you end up doing it for your followers instead of doing it for you. Uh And that's where I began burning out because it started, I was doing it for me. And then all of a sudden it started getting attention. And then all of a sudden I thought, I'll do it for my followers. And after two years of that, you can't keep it up. No. Because it's not for you. Um, So you just need to remember to continue doing exactly what you want to do instead of what people want to see. Uh Uh-huh. Um, and that's kind of where you, you wrote a script based on what you wanted people to see, not what people wanted to see. Uh-huh. Does it's that good, make Because what is that? Yeah. It's just this like ghost. Do you know what I mean, and yeah. the trends are so fickle. Yeah. Like, you, like you're saying, posting for a certain expectation of what your yeah. work should be. All it takes is like a hundred, like a hundred likes, and someone saying one comment that just hits you with it hurts. And if you're yeah. living and dying by that, but if you're doing it because this work interests me. Um, that's why I pursued it. Yeah. Then, like you're untouchable because the work you've done, like the the joy comes from like how you made it and what the process you went through, the failures, and then eventually getting the work that you wanted to present to people. Yeah, do you know what I mean like I think obviously there's a certain amount of ego involved. It's not just like becoming like to make anything or to put anything out there. There must be a sort of like ego, but I think it's like understanding the the, the kind of real joy from it or the real pleasure that isn't in that like presentation it's in the the kind of the work and the, the hurdles that came with it and i learned that especially with the script and realizing that the joy was and the kind of how hard it was at times but mm-hmm. then pursuing that rather than when you had the kind of premiere and stuff like that and when you had this sort of like fleeting recognition if you know yeah. what i mean because that's that's not something you can chase and you've seen people that do sort of try and sustain that because out, yeah. you can't, I mean, you can't, you're not going to chase like that feeling of like that, like, okay, uh, well, well done all the time. Do you know what I mean? That has to be going back and just saying, right, okay, what's, what interests yeah. me again, like I was saying. And you see it in um, like UFC fighters, Conor McGregor is a prime example. Mm-hmm. He was insanely talented and he obviously used to love the process of training. <clears throat> And he loved that process of walking into the ring and everyone's looking at him. He's got this huge fight on. And now he, he hits a point where he he's out a little bit, broke his leg. And now he's just chasing that feeling of being in the ring. But like, what else has he got now? Uh-huh. Does that make sense? Because he's no longer really training as much. Mm-hmm. So it's like you, you do need to just enjoy the process instead, instead of the end destination. What, what was the premiere like? It was like it was amazing. It was yeah. like it was. It was um, we we sold out our tickets within like an hour. Really, and um, the website crashed and all that. It was like it was us and like the opening film of the festival had sold out, and that was it. Like and then our other screening sold out. They put on a third screen. So in terms of reception, it was amazing, and yeah, uh, it was it was phenomenal. But I did feel like I was when I finished the finished this finished shooting in like October, I think twenty. What year is it? 2023, 22. I can't remember when the festival was. Was it Glasgow Film Festival 22? I think it was mm. early 22. But um, say it was like mid to late 21, was editing it, doing. I was doing the music for it, writing that, and then putting that together. Then I submitted it at the end of October to Glasgow Film Festival. I didn't hear back until like the 10th of December. So I was like working on the next idea. But then I, once I got accepted, then it was like, okay, it's now what's the next hat the producer hat i need yeah. to put on because i was thinking about how am i going to promote it and i was getting like my i was making my poster um i think i'd actually done that before i'd found out but uh i was thinking about all these other things and then yeah. on the run up i was doing a lot of press so i was thinking about that and then by the time the premiere came it was a kind of release in a lot of ways but it, it just felt with like this constant this constant thing that was going on and then we had other festivals we were going to so it wasn't really until i would say like the end of last year where i kind of felt done with it in a lot of ways um Mm. because the promotion and other screenings and all that were going on and on and then i went back to writing like full time uh, and that started feeling good but the the premiere was was phenomenal but you realize that like that sort of constant chaotic like promotion or that constant like contact with the audience if that makes that sounds terrible to say but that kind of really like wanting to have something all the time 
I just feel like you have to kind of step away and, and be yeah. like, right, where am I? You know, and try and ground yourself. And I, I, I was talking about the YouTubers earlier, and you see, like, imagine living in LA, yeah, and you've got like films coming out, and then you're looking at who's doing that and who's doing this, and you're seeing people in public, or but they got that, you know, and you you see how people lose their mind. It's toxic. You know? It's just like. I don't. I don't want to sound cliche about it, but I just like I'm. I'm so glad that I live in Scotland, and then I, I make things, and then like I do it in a quiet room. Um, and I'm just like so grateful for that process because I see like you see certain people and people that you admire, and you can see how it would like totally ruin them. Yeah, and I completely understand. It must be just devastating. Imagine having a PR team around you, and like, mm. did you did you watch the um the Lewis Capaldi documentary? Yeah. I don't know how you felt about it, but see when I saw his manager, like I wanted to fucking sm- like throttle him. See <laughs> yeah. when he was like, the boy was clearly like stressing about his album. It was during lockdown. His mate, who was like his band leader, was um, they were working so hard, and this like managers like um, listen to a tune like oh, yeah, but is it another someone you love? Yeah, yeah. And you're just like, what what kind of advice is that to a young yeah. artist that's tearing his hair out? And it's like. Yeah. we need another hit and then the, the song comes out yeah. and he releases another hit and they're all like you know yeah, dancing we said it, it. Be amazing. Like, we did it yeah. we did it and it's like what the fuck did you do do you know what I mean like you just like, yeah. that that really annoys me but imagine having that kind of team around you and you're yeah. constantly having to perform your previous like album and like try to match that the yeah. expectation do you mean that how could that not like totally destroy it can and you can, you can definitely um, see it in so many artists and that's how, how, why so many of them go into drugs mm-hmm. and not only artists you get actors that are constantly comparing themselves to their younger selves uh-huh. you're not going to age backwards like that you're going to get older you're not going to look the same way you do and mm-hmm. a lot of them get into drugs because they think oh you know i'm not that supermodel that i used to be mm-hmm. well yeah because you're 40 years old now like mm-hmm. it just it, it kind of just happens mm-hmm. i think that's where social media is so unbelievable and i've taken a kind of step back from it a lot recently unbelievably toxic especially for younger people um like it, it, it must be so difficult for parents especially to understand when to allow their son or daughter onto instagram and what they're gonna see i know i just i just think it's kind of comical but i just like i don't i'm i'm i'm, I'm lucky in that way but I've, I've i've never had that like that sort of like envy with stuff like with and like mm. seeing like I'm, I'm quite tuned out with stuff like that like i just i kind of see it where people are posting their highlight reels yeah. and but it's it's dead laughable when you see when you, you know certain people and, and all that and then you see what they put and you realize like or when you see people have photoshopped this or i mean like yeah. stuff like that i just kind of feel like a bit of pity for them and i just but you see it as just a big circus do you mean it's like mm-hmm. a big pr machine for yourself and like everyone's got everyone's creating a myth around themselves you know like my, myself included but i just see it as like a sort of online diarist like stuff yeah. that you did and it was like I, I do try and treat it quite lightly but I do see people that are consumed by it and you see the, the, the damage that can be done. But again, has that always been there with like paparazzi and like gossip mags and all that, you know? I mean, there's always a sort of version of it, but again, having that constant access and having the the constant dialogue, I think that must what, what drive you mate, drive you crazy as well. Like even like the constant dialogue, do you mean like that inner voice that's like yeah. you're seeing things bouncing back and yeah. that must just ruin you, especially when your brain's developing as well. It, well. Exactly. And I think especially within the travel niche that I used to work in, you, you'd, you'd come home for a week to edit and then you'd be looking at Instagram and you'd be like, oh, Tom is in Bali and uh, and uh, and Finley is in Lapland. And you're, oh shit, I should be somewhere. like that. And it's just that constant comparison is just so unbelievably toxic. Uh, on the point of social media, chat GBT is a new tool that's obviously <laughs> really scary. What is your opinion on that when it comes to script writing? I don't, I'm, I'm not like worried about it. I think it's obviously mm. like devastating like what the studios are trying to do, especially even with actors. I've seen somewhere it was like they want to like get extras in and pay them 50 fifty dollars and then they'll have like they'll be able to use their image, they'll scan them and then have their image in perpetuity like they can use it forever then for background work. Uh really? I, uh I seen that. But then I already felt sort of like a bit soul destroyed when I saw a screenshot from like I think it was like the Black Widow film. Mm. And it was like a sitting it was an interior scene in a bar and they green screened it and put in like actors at a bar. Like and it was oh, I just thought how bottom of the barrel was this yeah. like you can't just have a scene was, i don't know if it was just like union rights or they didn't have to pay background and i just thought this is terrible but with chat uh, gpt 
I think it's great for certain things like analytical stuff. Like I've like certain things like questions I'll ask it about writing and like why is this effective and then it'll pull together some ideas yeah. and you kinda of pick about what you want. But then I, I kinda of asked it to write a Sopranos episode set in Glasgow and it was just quite funny, but it was it was interesting what it pulled back and it was like some of the Tony lines they got but then some of it that you could just see they were sticking to like the basic principles of writing. It was like the hero's journey. So they had like six scenes and then it's like, oh, they end up back where they started at the beginning. Mm. And you just think like so much else goes into making a script uh, that is not is not to do with maths. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like so much of it is just emotional. And, and that's why it doesn't worry me because I, I don't think it'd be very successful. And I think anyone that does use it, uh, it'll be quite obvious. But then again, like who knows what could happen and, and, and how it could develop and how like skilled it could become. But it does depend on previous artists' own progression. Mm-hmm. You know, it's using it. I've used them um, I've used Adobe Firefly, just like the image oh, that's, generator. That's terrifyingly scary. It's, it's mad. But but yeah. then you're having to use like styles, like minimalism, you're having to use mm-hmm. like a neat like all these other things that had to be created before they could be imitated, you know what I mean? So it's not creating new styles. Yeah. I mean, it's impressive for, like, joke things, but it's, um, I, I just I just don't see it as, like, a serious competitor, really. But yeah. it's interesting how we'll, we'll sort of kind of move away from that, like, maybe move away from the more polished or the kind of, I don't know, the con... I'm trying to think of the best way to say it. Like, there's so much being forced in terms of budgets and there's so much being forced in terms of, like, doing it big and, like, having this polished look and even that ties into like social media that I just feel that it's going to take take a step back and move more towards the com- the community and I, I, yeah. that maybe sounds a bit mad but I think even just like live events yeah. um, getting away from like getting away from like I don't know if that's just my age as well but moving more rustic and things that feel more handmade and yeah. things that have got a yeah. voice behind them like I, I just feel that that's sort of where we're going rather than this sort of like a moving for like this kind of perfect digital this perfect like clean do you know what i mean i just see it yeah. changing the other way we see trends repeating themselves and like i think that the cycle of life goes up and down you know and i think that we will revert back i'm not sure if you remember like this is probably my like age as well but <clears throat> when i first got into instagram or youtube it was very much like memes and that <laughs> kind of thing it'll probably end up back there yeah. and like as that chat gpt robot said it'll end but end up back at the start uh-huh. um but i do think i you can see a movement away especially in videography there was all this really smooth movement <laughs> yeah. with the gimbal right yeah. but now i don't even have a gimbal anymore I, I put it into the studio in the office because you don't need it no like people think oh but then you need smooth footage you don't it's no. just a style I, i'll show you a video after i, I filmed a video for a client called Kint- kintra <clears throat> dj is really talented uh, and i filmed it all in one eighth of a shutter so it looks really cool because huh. you have like a really cool movement but they're static yeah really really cool but see t- typically speaking that's wrong yep but it's a creative style so you can you can do relatively what what you want uh-huh. uh, and i think that that is where i want to see these platforms go instead of this is what you should do and this will get views it should be do whatever you want and if you're creative enough you'll get views uh-huh and i think that's how it should be do you know i'm i'm just delighted either whether, whether i agree with it or not i'm always just delighted when i see whether it's in a script or whether it's in like a photograph whether it's in comedy where someone's made a choice the thing that kind of really like disgusts me the most is when I see something like trying to just like join it because that's what's moving and that's what mm. I was meaning earlier with the YouTubers and stuff. You've seen them twenty versions of themselves, and I think it's probably what we're speaking about trying to appeal to like keeping it going, yeah. keeping it moving. What are they doing? I should be doing that. I sh- and you just just having a sense of self, and like you look at certain like David Lynch films that are not going to appeal to a lot of people. Um, like a Tarkovsky film or whoever you know like some some director who's very specific in what they do and that's why you love them but mm. th- like you said there's things that how it should be done and now maybe that's what you'd learn in an academic subject you know yeah. or an academic uh, setting I should say but then there's how I like to do it and then it's like mm. I, I don't really care if you like it or not because this is and then that's how you find your people yeah. and then that's kind of the best way to do it. it's the same as being a you were talking about earlier with like um you have the photography side as well and when you yep. make that choice to like commit to something but then the group you would find who accepts you for that is the same with me like my, with my mates they're amazing it's like the people that accept you for that then they relationships last but like yep. the ones that you're doing just to kind of keep it going yeah 
dies and I think that's like creatively as well if you're doing that because right now it's in to have X, Y and Z in the cast or this genre's big yeah. but it's not because you've chose to do it um, again there's other like factors that are in play like if you can get financing and like what you need to do but uh, I just make a choice and have it come from you because you've looked at everything else and thought so that's for me I just think yeah. that's brilliant when you see that yeah and that there's so many like, I mean you saw the <clears throat> talking about LUTs which for anyone listening is basically like a it's like a filter really for a for a video for log footage you saw this huge trend in teal and orange do you remember that i i hated that oh, so did that, mate. i, I hated, hated that, that and that was sam colder that was this really by the way talented guy but he he curated that that teal and orange kind of look everyone for years man used this teal and orange look and it, even when it didn't work like you, you'd have a the greenery of Scotland and it'd be cloudy and they use teal and orange and you're like, why are you using that? Honestly, um, I had to be so specific as well and like even like California lots as well. It was like maybe they'd use green and purple in certain oh, ways in the highlights and then yeah. you see it here and you go, what the fuck is that? Like? Yeah, yeah. And that that, but I think that's a learning that people can take is you need to learn how to do it yourself. Don't emulate. Mm. Don't copy people. Do it yourself because it might go wrong the first couple of times. But after like the third or fourth, fifth, sixth time of doing it, you'll start to learn yourself and create your own unique look. Yeah. And you kind of see it amongst creators a lot. They'll pretty much directly copy. And because of that, they'll never have their own personality. Uh, they'll be chasing. Yeah, they're yeah. chasing. And yeah. that's that burnout that we we're talking about. Uh -huh. If you keep chasing that, you'll burn out because you're not you, you're somebody else. Uh -huh. Whereas if you create your own style and say, well, like, fuck everyone else, this is cool. I like it. You create your own personality uh -huh. and, and you're, ha you. you're, you're happy because yeah. the only frustration you're going to feel is like try to work out what it is you're trying to achieve yeah but i, I do i totally agree with that like um don't just call because in the early days you're going to be learning so much and you will copy to start with and maybe you'll do a tutorial or maybe you will just say like i want to try and get that but i think the big thing is trust your taste as well even yeah. because you're learning for people that are like these tutorials when you just pick up a camera and they say you should do this you know um i think trust your taste and say like that with a certain amount of experience under your belt be like i like it and this is how i want to do it yeah maybe not yeah. right out the gate because i think you need to know the rules to break them but at the same time like yeah. once you've got that grounding then just be like oh, I, I like this this is good it's so interesting you saying that about handheld and like gimbal stuff because i kind of um I shoot some weddings as well and it's funny because that used to be like such the way and it's like hardly anyone does gimbal shots anymore. It's yeah. all handheld and it's all getting that sort of like document and no doubt that'll change again and some yeah. people are like, oh, look how smooth this is. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It'll come back, but it's just yeah. fascinating watching it uh, change before your eyes like in real time. It's yeah. just, it blows my mind all the things that happens with. I need to pause this podcast really quickly to ask you a favor. If you have ever got any value out of these podcasts, if you have ever taken any learnings from the Into the Mind channel, if you could hit that subscribe button, the five-star button, like button, whatever it is and whatever social media platform you're on, I would really, really appreciate it. We're trying to hit our next target of 1,000 subscribers or 1,000 followers, whatever it might be. And if you can help us reach that goal, I would really appreciate it. All it means is that the guests will get bigger and we can have more insightful, deep, meaningful conversations. Thank you. What is your opinion on the kind of the cinema landscape now? I know that during COVID you had Cineworld that went pretty much bust. Um, what, what is your sort of opinion on the future of it? Uh, it's it's kind of difficult, I think, in a lot of ways. You get to get the big landmark films um, that come through like, conversations and like word of mouth, and then the like, other trends. You know, the kind of Barbenheimer stuff that came out. It's like kind of lightning in a bottle stuff. So if you get that, obviously there's no way to really orchestrate that. I think a lot of people will try and replicate what they did there, but really it's just like a lot of kind of sense of humor and then some sort of trend catching fire. Do you know what I mean? But I think it's director's names for me that's what takes me in and like here maybe from someone that i trust or someone that an opinion i respect that would get me to go at the cinema but i think it is becoming a, a wee bit more of a niche thing like th theater in, in some ways like going there and like going to something that's quite specific rather than the multiplex like like cine world is, is is good and everything like that but then i think like in america you're seeing i think tarantino just bought another cinema he's got one called the new beverly Mm -hmm. shows only in film but I think he just bought another one and I think it's maybe going to become rather than like we were speaking about earlier in terms of trying to appeal to all then it's really more like okay I'm going to appeal to like my tribe in some ways so people mm -hmm. that love films will, will sustain those like um, cinemas and then people that want to go and see the massive films they'll get shown 
like I, I, I think Barbie and all that stuff was like showing like every screen and every hour, you know, in certain cinemas and other smaller films can get in. Mm. Uh, so if the money's there, then those big films will get kept going. But in terms of cinema here, um, the GFT survived through COVID. They paid all their staff, um, but then like the. I don't know the the complete ins and outs of it, but I know that Film House in Edinburgh one day the doors just get closed and the Edinburgh mm-hmm. Film Festival went under. Now I think someone's I think at Edinburgh Film Festival's back. I think they just had one there or one's coming up, but um, they're doing a GoFundMe for like the Film House in Edinburgh, which is like one of these landmark cinemas. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's really hard to tell. It's really it really is hard to tell, but it's going to be dictated by the masses. It's going to be dictated by how people spend their money. Mm-hmm no doubt like lockdowns affected that and how we consume films I, I feel a wee bit differently you know you hear like directors talking about the only shooting film and like celluloid and stuff like that but to me you know i grew up with like videos and things and, and watching a lot of films on tv and like tv movies and things so i don't feel as precious i think a, a cinema with a packed audience is the best way to see a film hearing them oohing and ahhing and laughing and being shocked i think that's like the ultimate experience and films that are made for that in terms of like how they use the camera uh, in terms of how they capture the landscape they should be seen on a big screen but in terms of the future of it i i really don't know i think they will they will survive but it's um it might move to a more a more niche thing i think a part of it's to do with that attention span <clears throat> that we spoke about earlier just like on on tiktok or on instagram or on mm-hmm. youtube people like consuming things now in bite-sized chunks and i think and this is kind of partly why I like the the podcast so much. When you're not on your phone, you're on your Apple Watch. When you're not on your Apple Watch, you're on your computer. When you're not on your computer, you're on your TV, you're on YouTube. There's so much stimulus coming at people that they can't sit still. Mm. And like, I think that going to the movies is such a great thing because you do get that two hours away from your phone. Uh-huh. You you can get totally invested in into an incredible story, an incredible cinematography. And I think that the the podcast is kind of like that. You've got how well, how often do you speak to people for maybe two hours without a phone interruption? Mm-hmm. Like it's such a rare thing nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's so sad that cinemas are going the way th- that they are. Do you think part of the Edinburgh Film Festival that went under is that partly due to funding? I think I see. I don't know because the. I was seeing like obviously it's not what you're seeing on Twitter. Obviously, it's not like a verified source, but what the conversation was that they'd had the group, whoever ran it, the group that ran it had been getting millions and more money than like anyone else, like more than because Glasgow doesn't get very much. And mm. I think like obviously the G, the GFT is my favourite cinema, uh, and the, the Glasgow Film Festival is like phenomenal. But the Edinburgh is like the kind of oldest and like kind of flagship scottish film festival and it drew all these stars in you know for years it always has done jared butler used to go to that quite yeah, a lot. yeah he's been there and like they've had like sean connery and stuff like that and i'm sure scorsese's been and like david cronenberg all these guys have been up there but somehow i don't i don't know if it, i really don't know if it was embezzled or poorly spent mm-hmm. but how, how does where does that money go i really don't know what's going on i'd, I'd it's hard to tell with these groups and how they manage their money and i don't know if we'll ever know i don't know if it'll be investigated mm. but there's um brian jaffe he's like an edinburgh art critic um or like an art reporter art journalist i should say he's been really good on it and he's he's kind of reported on what's going on just now so the snp had originally said they're going to cut 6.6 million from creative scotland's budget mm. then they did a u-turn on it and then just recently they've done a U-turn again and taken it off. And the reason is it what's his name? Is it, is it Angus Robertson, who the culture secretary? I, I don't know who. I don't know if that's his name. But he basically said, yeah, due to um, we had to pay the pay rise to public sector workers, right? So, so basically saying teachers, nurses, NHS workers, right? Basically saying because of that we're cutting the arts. But then it just came out that um, the cyclone in Glasgow it went over eight million. So you're just it kind of blows your mind you know yeah. you're kind of like, like the way like i've watched the thick of it and stuff like that and like it's it's good fun and stuff but you start to think that is actually how it's run where it is just a, a spin war where yeah. it's like what we should do is we say this is we're cutting this but it's for a noble reason and art's the hardest thing to justify because if you're going to say what's the first thing it should be cut mm-hmm. it's people we're not going to pay for 
people to record music. We're not going to pay for people to put on plays where they dress up like funny characters and their costumes and pretend to be other people. Because what what does that do? Films. How much money did it make? You know, how much money did it make last year? Um, they're so hard to justify, um, but they're so vital and and not having it really, I think, affects how we see ourselves. I think Scotland really needs to... We saw a bit of it with Indiref and people kind of being proud and, and getting behind their country and all the rest of it. And I'm, I'm not trying to be patriotic, but I think even just as, like, if you're going to live here, you sort of need to, like, embrace your, your culture and, like, give people a chance to grow and, and to create and then mm. see what can happen. But it doesn't happen overnight. You don't invest a million last year and then by this year you've got, like, world-conquering artists and all that. It takes a lot of time and it takes generations of people teaching and seeing it could be a possibility. Um I, I just think it's going to take steady investment you're going to have to write some money off but you're going to build a culture and i just think that's so important but again so hard to justify i was i was going to ask you a question about y your your feature film you used actors that for, for free almost yep how did you keep them for three years so the core cast were like best mates of mine and a few just boys that I knew. Some I'd used in shorts before and some that I just met for the purpose of the film. Like I said, I'm going to make this film. I think a lot of people um, originally signed on and were excited by the idea of making a feature and perhaps like my mm. own sort of kind of boldness about it and saying, right, I'm making this, we're going to make it on the streets, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then as I was filming scenes, I would sort of show like what we'd done and I think people liked the look of it and I'd show wee snippets of stuff we'd filmed and obviously how I was using the camera. But then after a while, like my th my friends' thing was that that was the hardest because like they had families, like kids were being born and all that, and like they had jo like hard jobs, um, yeah. and then obviously they had a social life as well. And I'm asking them like in a winter's morning, a Sunday, like as soon as the light breaks, like can they get up, you know. So it was really really difficult on them, and that, I found that really hard because they weren't getting paid, um, and it was like poor conditions. But I think just um, trying to manage how I was doing it, like I would maybe try and film with other people, try and get mm -hmm. a scene like. Hopefully, I seen just with two people. I could just use them this weekend and then maybe film another bit and not have everyone like back to back to back. Like I'm taking up your next year, but that was really hard. That was more like a sort of politicking than it was a like, f filmmaking thing. You know, that mm. was just trying to gauge people's like reactions and like, okay, I'm pushing it here. I'm, I can't keep asking. I'm demanding too much from these people. Yeah. So, um, but I think as it, the more it went on, then maybe they saw like I, I was really serious about it. Um, but then I, I don't think anyone expected like the festival or like for it to go anywhere. It was just another project that we were doing. But that that was the hardest thing about making the film was doing that part. Yeah, yeah. Is 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 is? Did you feel that you were maybe badgering people uh -huh. because you wanted to get it done? Aye. Yeah, and did you think that it slowed the process a little bit? I I just think that I could only film at weekends. Um, yeah. And they were my friends, you know, and, and I, my sole thing, all consuming was this film and I just couldn't wait for it to get made and I wanted to shoot all the time and I wanted to shoot every day for hours if I could, but I couldn't. Um, so I was so conscious of time when they came um, and trying to get them organised that I, I perhaps wasn't like a, a very like, present friend, if you know what I mean. Like I was more in this like, right, let's get this done. Uh, and I was very conscious of it. Like I was never like screaming at people like, this is my film. You know, I was never yeah. like that. I was just very like, right, we need to get like three pages done. Like, can we, let's get through this. But it was a great sort of learning curve, but uh, for, for no money and, and like for people who weren't like aspiring to be actors. Do you know what I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how, how we've done it, but... Uh, that that was that was really difficult and when you were growing up did you have kind of like a solid group of friends with you from the start or did you did you meet these friends that, that were in this film with you on on the project so to speak in photography and video i met friends through it like people who were cast who um i'm very friendly with now but the core group the people that i filmed sketches with for years um i've been friends since i was like five like mm -hmm. lived in my street and lived around the corner from me uh so we we've always sort of grew up together, had the same sense of humour. Um, they're not all like, but they're all sort of like quite creative in terms of we've all got the same sense of humour. Mm. And and they're all it's it's kind of fascinating that they were all willing to come on camera because I've spoke to people and like my friends would never do that. And when I think about it, it's like it is a big thing to see lines on a camera and to like appear and put a costume on and play a role. Like it is like it takes a kind of certain type of person to be okay doing that. But I think it's because we've always done it, and I think because. I just I, I didn't look at it any different way see if I was just a director and I was saying right you're my actor mm -hmm. see because I was doing lines and stuff and because like we were all always sort of playing in a way in terms of having a joke together mm. I think it didn't feel any different to that I just feel like an extension of that so it was uh, it's quite bizarre that they were all fine doing it um, and they were all so comfortable doing it but they've been friends since I was like five years old yeah yeah I was, it's, it's, I'm just thinking of my 
group of friends and my group of friends from school they're 100 percent supportive i love them to pieces they would not be caught dead on camera <laughs> no, and, and very few people would yeah i mean if you ever like you ever shoot like a corporate video for someone that's not very familiar with it and oh, they know yeah. a script and, and as soon as that camera starts rolling and they're looking at the lens it's like you see that sort of like death stare yeah. and it's like they realize like there's a camera there someone's going to see this uh, how do I look? Is my lip moving funny? You yeah. know, how's my dress and my shirt? Fit? You know, when you start to see that, and to be able to switch that off, and obviously never switch it off, but to do that and play it humorous and wait for a camera set up mm -hmm. and traffic interrupts you, do you know what I mean it's amazing they did that? But I, I very few people would be willing to appear on camera mm -hmm. and play a role. So like, um, I'm very lucky. Yeah. And what what are your is your advice with someone that's wanting to take that first step and sit in front of that camera and actually do say they want to be a, a YouTuber? Yeah. for example when they, they want to take that first step what would be your advice to to maybe like start acting that little bit more natural in front of the camera i think it needs to come from your own personality i think it needs to come like tom at mcgregor earlier you see fighters that try and imitate that style mm. and it's not for them but then you can get someone who's equally successful or, or like iconic in their own way by playing their own role because it seems like they're comfortable now obviously there's a performative element even to like mcgregor mm -hmm. and to these people that play it down and maybe are a wee bit more like aloof like say someone like habib yeah someone's got a kind of drier sense of humor but still very fun now they're i'm not saying that they are just completely natural and that's just them there's obviously an element of performance but if you're this way um like if it feels like everything in your body's fighting to do that like to fighting against that sort of nature then what's your own style of doing it that it's the same as we spoke about earlier like not try to appeal to a trend just saying if you're quite a dry person like maybe play to that you maybe yeah. you need to develop maybe your speech and you maybe need to develop like not repeating like going to, um yeah you mean like you yeah. might cut stuff like that out the stuff that comes out when you're just trying to get work things out in front of a camera yeah but uh, i think it needs to come from your own sort of style um but then again, if you're going to be an actor, then it can help to do that because you need to get out of your comfort zone. So it's a tough, a tough one. If you want to be an actor, go to acting classes and really just put yourself to the test like in amongst mm -hmm. a group of people that are supportive and aren't going to judge you. They all want the same thing. If you want to be like a YouTuber, that, again, I think it should just come from people that are being themselves or an elevated version of themselves, but one that they're comfortable in. That's what I think. Yeah, I'd agree. And I think that's that kind of pretending to be somebody or trying to be different to what you are is where creative burnout comes in yeah because you can maintain it for a while but after two years of pretending to be someone else you're gonna burn out uh -huh. and you've also curated an audience based on not you uh-huh so if you sit in front of the camera the first time just try and be yourself and if that's quiet and reserved then that's okay but don't be uh, we spoke to adrian barker in another podcast episode who's a very successful youtuber and he said when he first started he would look at logan paul and he would look at um these casey neistat these big youtubers and he would try and emulate that energy sure but it wasn't him and then as soon as he stopped emulating that energy which took him about two years and just was himself that's where he got real traction uh -huh. because people connect with it and they can see the, the kind of lie that you're telling yep. so to speak when I used to with Drew in, in the studio when I used to first did Chisholm Hunter videos I was like the most awkward weird kid that was trying to make myself out to be something that I wasn't and then it took a long time and a lot of practice for that to drop but once that does drop and that guard drops which I suppose is just repetition uh -huh. that's when the real you comes out uh -huh. and that's when people actually connect with you because you're like a real person uh -huh. Um. How do you, so when you were filming with your friends, there was obviously this weird parallax between you being friends with them, but you also wanting to get a job done. Mm -hmm. How did you kind of direct them? Because sometimes, if I think of like, if I've got Andy, one of my best pals, if I try and direct him in something, he goes, I oh, fuck off. Uh -huh. <laughs> how, how did how did that work? There was that, like I did, I took like a really, like a lot of slagging, but yeah. you know, like it's, it's funny because it's because they're there at the end of the day, so there's love there, you know, they're there, they've turned up for you, so mm -hmm. whatever they want to say is fine. And you know, we're pulling people out of bed that were hung over and stuff like that, you know, yeah. so it was it, it was funny. Um, I think directing them, I'd written for their like personas, you know, I'd written for stuff I knew they could do, so they already knew how to play it. Mm -hmm. There'd maybe be like wee minor things, like maybe 
maybe they'd go like that in a scene and I, I would be like no don't do that because that's like defensive like sit forward and put your head in their yeah. space because that's more you know like certain things are just like maybe would be visual yeah um but you keep it very short you're not getting into motivations or anything it's maybe just a kind of one line sentence but i mean that's how i'd like to be directed you know it'd just be like keep it very like kind of general don't be given like line readings unless it's way off or it's a comedic thing that i think it maybe should be slowed down but I think it's just I think it's just the same way with everyone else. It's just writing the scene, understanding what the scene's about, and then maybe just like gentle, gentle moves here and there. Mm. And uh, I, I don't think there's like a huge amount else you need to do if the writing's okay and you understand what you're filming, really. Mm. Yeah, no, that that interesting. Just because there's this thing in Scottish culture where it is, and especially for much friends group, friends groups, it's like very dry. Uh sarcastic like you know go away do you think there was it was quite a nice thing in terms of like a bonding experience as well you were all in this project together you were all trying to complete something together and, I, and there was a, almost a sense of uh camaraderie in a way because yeah. from from experience i felt this like for, i was shooting in norway with a couple of pals of mine and we'd get up at you know shit o'clock to go and see the northern lights and stay up all night and you're knackered but you're all in it together uh -huh. and there's like a really nice aspect of camaraderie do you did you feel that i think um at the end perhaps i think going to festival that's when they, or when we get in and stuff like that then there was a sense of ownership there because mm. they didn't know where it was going to go or if it would even work when it was finished or how things would go i think I think there was, in a sense, that this kind of rallying around each other and the fact that we were all getting put together all the time and out. Someone has to take charge, whether it's a night out or you're filming, someone has to be the one that will take shit from everyone or, or mm. like be people can be annoyed at, but also that can organise people, you know, and it's not always the same person, do you know what I mean? Sometimes it's like someone else in the group who can organise a night out and someone times on set, someone committing to a role, like one of the one of the boys really goes for it with a line reading or something then other people kick and it can be all different people mm. uh but but i do think like it has to be a sense of like we are in we, we are in this together but again i don't know if that was evident at the time or if i was it must be there must have been something there but i don't know if it was just a kind of their friendship to me that they were just kind of we'll get this done but it was such long nights and days sometimes that you know, God bless them, really, because mm. I, I don't know if I could do that for someone else, which is the, the, the truth, you know, and, I, and I've been on other sets and stuff, but I, I was pretty well organised, like, on my short list, and I, didn't, I tried not to waste anyone's time, and I think maybe they saw how serious I was taking it, yeah. and perhaps they liked the material, so maybe that kept them coming back, but I think definitely you need to keep seeing each other as well. I think that's probably, as you get older, as I think having that thing every so often, we would all get together to film. Yeah. It probably was good having this sort of club we were part of, like getting this yeah. film done because it's so easy to kind of fall apart. But uh, hey, God bless them for keep coming up. Also, it was, a, it was a reason to see each other and not drink alcohol. Mm. I think that a lot of um, my friends at the start didn't really understand it when I would I'd, I'd have a, you know, Monday through Friday, I'd be working. Saturday, I'd be up at two in the morning to climb a hill to get that sunrise shot. Mm -hmm. Sunday, I'd be editing what I'd filmed on the Saturday. So there wasn't really any time. This went on for like a year or two years. There wasn't really any time for booze or alcohol. And like, I think that when you have time apart from alcohol, I'm not sure if you feel the same way, but when I had that time apart from alcohol, I realized how productive my weekends could be. Because uh -huh. um, I didn't, I just did so much that I wouldn't have, you know, Saturday night or Friday night, you go out drinking, Sa Saturday you're hungover or Saturday you go out drinking, Sunday you're hungover. It wastes the whole two days. Uh -huh. Whereas you can literally build within, uh, within a year, two years of not drinking at weekends, your future. So see if you're in a job that you don't really like, a nine to five within your weekends use those weekends to build what you want your right. future to look like and then when it does come t come time to pull the plug on the job you can switch straight over when you were filming for this future future film or feature film did you stop going out of the weekends because you were i think it's, it's hard to remember because i think what had happened was i would maybe be like getting ready to shoot on a saturday or sunday but I'm a bit of a home bird anyway and that, but a lot of my mates have kids and stuff like that so maybe we would see each other once a month and that would be a sort of night we would do so I tried to maintain that as much as I could like just to kind of not to be all like anytime I see you I'm just using you to get Working. my film made you know what I mean so um, 
during the week and the weekend I'm pretty structured anyway in terms of like going to the gym and, and focusing on the project so night before obviously it'll be like anxiety and preparation to death like on my shot list double checking everything's okay getting the car filled up with equipment getting ready to go so that was never really a question about drinking or anything but probably after I'd done like a long day of filming maybe have something at night and just kind of relax mm. but again I think it's because I had this overarching thing it wasn't like a weekend to weekend thing where I was like what am I doing now what am I doing now it was just a long goal I felt like that was okay to do that because I was yeah. on point I'd got something made that that night but I think you're totally right and I think that comes back to setting time aside to be creative or, or productive or whatever like you yeah. have to create it because like your time will get eaten up another way yeah and unless you do that at the weekend but it can be difficult as well like taking time apart for like going for a drink and if it is maybe a week uh, every weekend sort of thing I'm uh, my friend group's a wee bit older so we don't see each other every weekend but if, if you are in that cycle and you take a step back it can look like judgment to your friends do you know what I mean but I think if they see it's for something that you really care about and it's not just to sit and do nothing with other people then they should be understanding if they're not then yeah. you know your answer don't you yeah and, and I think that yeah it's interesting you say that um I think that within Scotland there's a huge binge drinking culture mm -hmm. And no, no detriment. I think it's you know like listen. I'm I'm a Scot. You're a Scot. I'm sure we've had a drink in our time. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, where I struggled is that when I would go out at the weekends with my friends, it wouldn't be like a, a glass of wine or a beer. It would be like let's get on it. Like let's get smashed. And I think that that's the kind of pitfall that people can fall into. Is um you know my weekends, the fun at my weekends is going to be drinking a ton of alcohol. Um, and then not really remembering what happened that night and waking up hungover on a Sunday. I think that if people just for one month had three weekends clean from alcohol, uh, specifically binge drinking, listen, if you have a glass of wine a night, I get it. Um, you know, me and my girlfriend had one last night. It's not the end of the world, but specifically binge drinking, you, you'll realize how much of a cloud that can hang over your brain, like both physically and mentally because it, it really is poison to your body essentially i'm not saying that i don't drink but you can become so much more creative and you can become so much more um in control of your time if you're in the right frame of mind i think i think it's difficult though because i understand I understand what you're saying if you were to take a month away but if you don't have that kind of grand passion we were talking about earlier if you take away that time where you're basically you, you can change your identity to become this fun loving person to become life and soul if you can then become this person when you drink the person you like the people the person you think other people like take that away and it's like who am i then they need to find out what they want to do then they need to they confront time that they've lost i'm talking about someone that's probably like a binge drinker all the time and that's yeah. their one love or that's the thing where they feel like they can be themselves they've yeah. got a job they've got kids um you're, you're absolutely right that time could transform your life but then there's hard questions that need to get asked and if you if you don't know the answers by the time you're a certain age then you are going to be like that's i can't deal with that that's like yeah. like looking at the sun i can't really confront myself and say what would i like to do if i really committed the time it's easier to just kind of stay in the cycle and like forget about it and feel good yeah. you, you know it's 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 really really tough no absolutely and just look at uh, thinking about what you've it's interesting what you've said there. I think that you're so right in terms of you need to look in within yourself and say, you know, who am I? Mm. What do I want to do? And is this nine to five what I really want to do? I think maybe what broke the cycle within yourself and also me is the fact that maybe because you didn't go to university mm. and, and me as well, all my friends moved away from Glasgow, whereas I stayed in Glasgow. So maybe there was a part of me that through those weekends with them being away and me being here, looked in and said you know who actually are you what do soul you actually want to do time. i agree and you do have that time to soul search mm. whereas when you're at uni <clears throat> um spe specifically for my friends they were drinking the whole thing they were having great fun oh. like they were, they were and listen hats off to them that you know that i'm not saying it's bad but i'm just saying you do need that reflective time same as like we're talking about creative but yeah being like a, a slave to the the content a slave to being posting Mm -hmm. you know it's the same thing if you're constantly in the mix and being like forward facing yep. that introspection time like taking a step back having that time at that age as well that's vital and that was it was the same for me well mm -hmm. just after high school really that was the kind of my formative years in terms of like who i'm what am i doing what i enjoy like who was i before 
other like school was really kind of like that to me in like, terms of like quite hard in terms of you put a face on and like your, your expectations I felt that more there than anywhere after high school I've always been quite comfortable and been lucky that I found something I like to do at quite a young age in terms of a young adult but high school was really difficult um but I think I think you're absolutely right it's like you need that time to step back and be like okay introspective time what am I into how do I assess what's happened before um and, and what am I doing going forward I just think that's like so important but you you have to create it like it's not going to yeah. come by itself you need to kind of sit and meditate or like sit in a dark room or just take yourself out of the situation and then look at it I think yeah yeah and also be free of stimulant mm. like I think that people don't understand how engaging and how brilliant these apps are at just totally hijacking your your tri- like how often do you sit on TikTok and then all of a sudden three hours have gone two hours have gone and you're like what the f- what have I even watched mm. they're so great at hijacking your attention you see if you look at your screen time we I think if we said this before I can't even remember if it's been on the podcast or not <coughs> If you look at your screen time, you will find the time that you could have invested in something else. It's devastating, isn't it? 100%. And it's, you, you feel so guilty about it because you think, how is this app taking up, I don't know, eight hours of my time this week? I, I, I can't even remember going on it. And that's that's like one of the issues with social media and creativity. creativity. It just hijacks your brain and then you start comparing yourself and then you just go down that spiral. Joe, it's so funny, like, see, speaking about cinemas and things like that, and talking about screen time, it's kind of fascinating, like, in my mind, there should be room for everyone, right, there should be, like, everyone, there should be enough resources to go around, but you realise that, like, everything's, like, a fight, everything's a fight, like, when the cinemas fail, what's booming? Mm-hmm. like it's the where's the money at just now it's in the only it's in tiktok it's in that when you take when one boom something suffers mm-hmm. and it's just so interesting to see how like the money flows and like how people thought tv would kill cinema and like you know cinema would kill the novel and like not people that read novels would you know, do you know what i mean like how every time a new sort of form comes about that it, it takes away from the previous one or people think it's going to destroy the previous one but i just find it fascinating like where where it goes and like what's going to like what's going to come next in terms of immersion or in terms of where the eyeballs will be but the one thing i think is like as much as i laugh at pretty like old videos with my mates all the time like kind of stuff i've seen like the odd video that gets sent something funny or a meme or whatever but like there are films and there's like pieces of art that leave a mark on you and you like you do really kind of inform who you are but then like you're saying they could be four hours go by and like you really can't remember like what you've watched or mm. and it won't affect you at all like it's not going to be something you think about in your deathbed at all do you mean? well well that's that's literally it like if you if you watch a movie if you have a conversation with someone and, you, and you're glancing at your phone all the time you probably won't remember the conversation mm. right and that's partially why i love this like podcasting as well because you actually remember the conversation and you're actually into the conversation you're involved in it directly um but if you watch a movie in the cinema the odds are you won't really have your phone out because it's disrespectful you shouldn't have your phone definitely shouldn't right when you watch a film at home you're probably going to be glancing at your phone you're not truly invested you don't really get into it and and that that's the kind of issue with certain things going out of fashion like say cinemas Mm -hmm. people won't get that true experience Mm -hmm. of what it should be like but through your craft you can create things that will actually have an impression instead of the fast food content that people are digesting on tiktok Mm -hmm. um and it it totally is so i was just gonna say it's it's difficult though because you're kind of as much as you're not trying to look outside we're saying you'd be true to yourself to enable you say to give yourself a certain lifestyle or to give you time to create more perhaps you do need to then like jump on the trend to make the money do you mean to get Mm. the eyeballs to then sustain you and get noticed because like i I can speak as much about you know like integrity and and doing it for yourself and being an artist and all that but the end of the day i do want people to see what i want to reach people and hopefully people to engage with with my work Mm. so that's i think that sort of conflict is interesting and i think there'll be conflict in anything you do but that conflict between being true to yourself but then also giving people like what something serving them you know giving them something Mm. so it's so difficult like you do you need to engage with a system you don't really like or enjoy whether that's like funding or like networking or online sort of like whatever whatever it is pr and 
but to enable this other passion it seems like there's like this pro and con or this sacrifice and like gain um and everything that you do but i suppose it's just having the balance right where there's enough for you left and, and you're not totally like giving yourself over um, mm. or like selling your soul or whatever but i mean like who knows you need to ask someone yeah. and to see how they feel about it yeah I, yeah and you're you're totally right i think the way that i kind of try to do it and this doesn't always work but the way that i try to do it is do you know five videos commercially for essentially somebody else and then do one passion project yeah and keep that system of yeah i need to keep the train moving the engine running but also there's always going to be that space for me uh-huh. which is what important and that's where you actually learn and grow and develop and think for example that that video for for kintra that i filmed i tried a totally different style and it worked mm. and i was like shit that actually looks really cool uh-huh. if i hadn't have tried that technique for me essentially because it was a free gig i would never then use it does mm-hmm. that make sense um so yeah i think it's just it's just finding uh, that what one little gap that you can you can create for yourself not just to feed the engine and that will keep you ticking over and keep you motivated and then you won't burn out mm-hmm. because you will have that moment for yourself looking back on your videography career so far what is the one thing that you would tell yourself at the start? I think it's a, uh, to, to be honest, it's something I keep telling myself as well. It's like, just keep keep moving and keep making things and keep expanding your knowledge and trying to keep keep going because I think a, a lot of time is spent in doubt and like self-reflective. Like when I was writing, I write like a lot of notes like I'm writing scripts. Like it's not just a traditional like um, fade in page, you know, scene one, act one or whatever, you know, it's not for me anyway. Like I write a lot of notes and it's hard for me to tell whether that's helpful or that's me just having a dialogue with myself and like journaling in a way. Does that make mm. sense? Let's like, see when I've, I've got like three or four notebooks just with this most recent script, like filled to the brim just to like, and I don't know if I'm making any progress when I'm doing that. Um, so for me, it's like trying to find the balance between like staying active because you, you can be busy but not going anywhere do you know what I mean like you could be like oh I'm doing this and I'm doing that that you could be doing like 10 corporate gigs a, a day or whatever but see if it's the same thing mm-hmm. and it's repetitive like you're not really doing like you're not you're not stretching yourself uh-huh so yeah. I think it's that it's trying to figure out where's the, the kind of line between s- sitting down and being like this is a creative time and like pushing yourself in that direction and then been, been also being able to be like analytical about it so that's kind of for me is really just like just keep trying to push forward and getting things done um but but then again you know you always kind of be telling yourself that and sometimes you need to tell yourself to pull back a bit and sort of analyze so but i think just uh keep moving really that's that's my one thing keep creating keep moving yep yeah and if you were to say i, I were to be here and i've never touched a camera and uh, i want to be a videographer mm-hmm. what are the three things you'd tell me um interview the oldest person in your family and ask them to talk about like your family history that's what i would do i'd, I'd tell them to go and get like an oral history and just sit and have a conversation with them mm. um i'd tell them to go to their the place they grew up and just walk around with the camera and, and anything that catches their eye just record it and try and edit it what would be the third thing if they wanted to direct, I'd have them um, act a scene out on camera just to see how uncomfortable it can be, just to give them an appreciation of actors and like, how hard it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if they just wanted to be like a, just to use the video, um, I would say just every day, just document like a 10 second clip of something that catches your eye. I think that's maybe a repetition of two, but I think that's really important, like sitting with people, getting a rapport with them. Um, and really seeing what the camera sees maybe it would be an exercise where you would do certain like different techniques maybe without cutting just try and do this movement like try and practice camera movements but mm. i don't know if that'd be too advanced for someone who's never touched a camera but i i would say those are my tips yeah what was it what was it like when you first sat in front of a camera do you remember well see i'd, I'd sort of done acting in primaries like school and i was always a bit of a sort of like class clown so i kind of felt that was natural but when i went stopped doing acting classes obviously it's still a bit of a kind of class clown but um when i tried to go back to it like when i started writing again i did like in front of the, my my phone which was fine because it was just me you know and i was in control of it but when i went to go and audition for like, the conservatoire like i remember just feeling this like 
sickness like really really didn't that didn't feel right at all didn't feel like i was where i should be um and then that was really hard like see being in front of like people and performing like the respect to like theater actors and obviously that's like a muscle as well like getting comfortable with that and um but i really just felt so self-conscious and um, so that was difficult but in terms of being in front of a camera it's a wee bit different i've done acting them um, for other projects where I, i've not been the director or, or things like that mm. and i do feel fine doing it I just don't know why it's like in sort of a live audience and maybe it was just that that, that environment when I was auditioning for something it was like a job interview yeah. mixed with performance and it was like a Shakespeare piece and stuff I had to do and anxiety of it I, yeah but which I never had before I just thought yeah. I would turn it I would all come back like when I was like a, a younger guy and I was doing it like all the time in front of like a drama class but uh, I, I definitely think anybody that wants to direct or even write should go and do acting classes like really just to kind of meet even just to meet actors even to a selfish point of view just to go and network but mm. uh i think I, it's, it's it's just it's a uh, it's really hard like it's really, and you know yourself like trying yeah. to get in the early days even just being in front of camera as you were saying it's like respect to them it's a real skill what do you think is next in the career for you are you writing anything else i've just finished a script called anyone can get it it's like a crime family drama set in like pretty much where i where i grew up but um and that in, in glasgow but i'm in two minds about it in terms of wh- how it's going to go ideally if i could get funding for it i'd love to do a live action but i'm doing a lot of 3d animation stuff just now and i think there could be a lot that could be done creatively there in terms of control like i can essentially i could build the sets the costumes to a level like control lighting control camera movement and i think it could be like really interesting but I need to do quite a lot of tests and just see how that would pan out. But I'm just kind of awaiting feedback and I'm just going to tweet the script a bit. Um, but that's it, kind of another feature. Maybe do a couple of shorts just to test out some animation work. Um, and uh, that's the, the main the main thing I'm going to be working on. Yeah, and keep, keep grinding, I suppose. Definitely, man. For sure. Well, listen, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And also, I appreciate how sort of open and honest you were about everything. Um and I think it's pretty inspirational. <laughs> Thank I, you, mate. I, I think the the movie that you created, um, with what you had at that time, is genuinely uh, really inspirational. When when I look at the kind of the kit that I have and that I've built over the years, you realise how incredible, incredibly lucky and blessed you are to have that kind of stuff. Definitely. So thank you so much. Thank mate. you, mate. I appreciate that. I had a great time.